you've been watching my channel, you know that both my books are basically books about books, like a coffee table book about coffee tables, but more interesting. But hey, a coffee table book about coffee table books? Maybe that has potential. Today, we're gonna to talk about some of the books that have inspired me to put my own spin on this very niche genre. Hi there, I'm Linda Maxey, the author of the Library Land Guides to Superlative Nonfiction Books. I've talked at length about my books on other videos, and I'll link those videos in the description box below if you're interested. Ever since I found the first of this type of book, I've been a sucker for these kinds of books, and I have quite a few, but today I'm going to share with you my four favorites. This first book is the first book I ever encountered of this type. It's my first love, you might say. I found this book when I was working at the circulation desk at a public library near me back in the late 1980s. I was ecstatic at the very idea of this book. I read it and finally spent some of my meager income to purchase a more recent updated copy of it. The book is The Lifetime Reading Plan, An Introduction to More Than 100 Classics of Western Literature and Thought, and the Start of a Lifetime Conversation with Some of the Liveliest Thinkers of Our Civilization. That's quite a title. The author Clifton Fadiman was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1904, and he died at the close of the century in 1999. He loved to read and read everything he could from a very young age. After he graduated from Columbia in 1925, he became a teacher and then an editor, first at Simon & Schuster, and then at the New Yorker. He was also in, on the editorial board of the Book of the Month Club, and he was on the board of editors for the Encyclopedia Britannica. And you know who else was on the um, editorial board for the Encyclopedia Britannica? Mortimer J. Adler. Fadiman was also a host for radio shows and TV shows. Now, he was writing in 1988, and the world has changed quite a bit since 1988, so I thought this was really interesting, and I'm going to read you what he says about who he wrote this book for. In general, the plan is meant for Americans from 18 to 80 plus who are curious to see what their minds can master in the course of their remaining lifetime, but who have not met more than 10%, let us say, of the writers listed. It's meant for college graduates who were exposed to many of these books during the undergraduate years, but who successfully resisted their influence. It's meant for the college graduate, his or her name is Legion, to whom most of these writers are hardly even names. It's meant for the high school graduate, who might well have profited from a college education, but did not have the chance to do so. It's intended for that great and growing army of intelligent men and women who, in their middle years, are penetrated by a vague, uncomfortable sense that the mere solution of the daily problems of living is not enough that somewhere worlds of thought and feeling call out for exploration. It's intended for the eager young man or woman of modest means, many of these books can be bought for little money, for whom the thrills of business competition or homemaking, while valid, are inadequate. It's intended for the retired elderly who have found that growing roses or looking at television does not leave them mentally exhausted. It's intended for teachers, college teachers too in some cases, who would like to deepen and extend their knowledge and sensitivity and so deepen and extend the non-material reward of their noble vacation. In its small way, the Lifetime Leading Plan is a contribution to the solution of the problem of that imminent leisure era, which may prove either an opportunity or a horror. Did we ever get a leisure era? I don't think so. In the introduction, he also explains why he left out Eastern classics, and it's not that hard to understand. This book is for people who grew up in Western culture and want to better understand the culture that they came from. But a quick glance through the table of contents reveals that perhaps 5% of the titles in here are by women, and maybe one, maybe one, I think, by someone of color. So um, the rest were written by white men. Even the poetry section contains no women poets or people of color, none. And this is hard for me to fathom. It's interesting to me that I didn't even notice this omission in my 20s. I went back and read the introduction and he makes no mention 
of the omission of women authors. He does explain why he left out works of science, and he seems disturbed by that. I chalk this up to the time he grew up in and lived. His life spanned the entire 20th century. He makes no claims that these are a best books list. He merely says that the works have greatly influenced Western culture. I'd recommend this book as a reference source. There's nothing wrong with reading the books he recommends, but I would argue that the list is incomplete. I don't think we're fat and alive today that he would disagree with me on that. His book descriptions make you want to read these books, and I think it's a good contribution to a reader's library. I keep notes on the books I'm reading in reading notebooks that I've been showing you. I have stacks of these notebooks from over the years. Pens that don't write smoothly are a pet peeve of mine. So I was happy when Bastion Pens offered to send me one of their cool bolt-action aluminum models that come in an assortment of great colors. If you'd like to get one for yourself, Use the link in the description box below and the code LINDA20 to get a 20% discount on your order. The next book is in my top 10 favorite books of all time that I have ever read in my life, and it is 1,000 Books to Read Before You Die, A Life-Changing List by James Mustich. Words cannot describe how much I love that book. It is a book lover's dream. James Mustich is a lifetime reader. For 20 years, he owned and edited the Common Reader Catalog. This book is partly made up of entries for the celebrated mail order catalog. He doesn't focus on classics or serious nonfiction, and he has a little bit of all sorts of books, from picture books to children's books to horror novels for adults, as well as a nice assortment of nonfiction titles of all sorts. The book was originally published by Workman Publishing Company, a publisher that I still wish very much was with us. I so admired the works they produced. How did Mustich choose his 1,000 books? Well, I'm going to read you what he says in the introduction. I came upon the clue I needed in a passage written by the critic Edmund Wilson describing the miscellaneous learning of the bookstore. Unorganized by any larger pur purchase, the undisciplined, undirected curiosity of the indolent lover of reading, unquote. There, I knew instinctively, was a workable conceit. What if I had a bookstore that could only hold a thousand volumes, and I wanted to ensure that it held not only books for all time, but also books for the moment, books to be savored or devoured in a night? A shop where any reading inclination, be it for thrillers or theology or theological thrillers, might find reward. In the end, I was back in my favorite haunt, a browser's version of paradise. And that it is. This book is organized by author's last names. There aren't really chapters, but A covers Edward Abbey to Jane Austen. Here are some of the pages in this treasure. At the end of each intriguing section, he provides other books by the author and further reading suggestions. In the end of the book, he has reading lists for special occasions like read in a sitting, LOL, family read alouds, and my favorite, mind expanding. He also offers a handy dandy checklist of the books at the end so you can check them off as you read them. I didn't see that until I had started the book unfortunately and I just went ahead and started checking beside the book title in the front. I'll have to add here because I'm very proud of it that James Mustich provided an endorsement for my book Library Land's curated collection of superlative nonfiction. Unfortunately I got the endorsement too late to put it in the book. I have it on my Amazon page and on my website. Here's what he said. I am thrilled that my volume has earned a small place in Library Lynn's curated collection of superlative nonfiction. Linda Maxey's compendium exudes both qualities I treasure in accomplished librarians, unbounded expertise and unstinting generosity in sharing it. Any curious reader will find her guidance to the best in nonfiction, not only helpful, but inspiring. The next book I bought on a whim Honestly, it was an impulse purchase because I like the cover. It is 500 Must Read Books, and it was published in the United Kingdom by Bounty Books. Most of the books in this volume are fiction. There are recommended history, memoir, and travel writing sections for nonfiction, but the fiction includes works for children, classics, modern fiction, science fiction, and thrillers. Some of these books are standard. I've seen book reviews from people who object to the same titles being referred to again and again. This has never bothered me. Some people, as hard as it may be for bibliophiles like us to understand, will not have heard of them. 
and they may need to be convinced to give them a try. But this book has plenty of recommendations that I was unfamiliar with. The authors of the recommended books are from all over the world, but a quick flip through will reveal that most, but not all by any means, are by American and European authors, and the Europeans are mostly from Britain. One of these days, I may explore this book. There's a lot here that I've not yet read. And besides, it's just another fun book to flip through. And the final book in my favorite books of this small genre is Bibliophile, an illustrated miscellany by designer and illustrator James Mount. Mount is known for her artwork, particularly ones that depict book collections. This book is sort of her ode to books, libraries, and bookshops, and the people who love them. I read some reviews that complain, like with the last book, that there are very few new recommendations in this book. Most of the books in it are fairly standard, and like I said before, even if that were true, it doesn't bother me, but I don't think it's true of this book. She has a lot of interesting things to recommend that I had never heard of, and it's a truly beautiful book absolute eye candy for a book lover. She has sections called Book Club Darlings, Iconic Book Covers, Beloved Bookstores, Striking Libraries, and Writing Rooms. These are nice little asides in between the sections of books she recommends, and some of her book lists are things like Creativity, Cookbooks, How to Write, and war. And I think this is absolutely awesome. I wouldn't really use this book as a reference. I would use it as a feast for the eyes and maybe some inspiration if I'm stuck in a rut and want to pull myself out of it. It would make an excellent gift for a book lover. Two other books, of course, about books are my works, Library Lens, Curated Collection of Superlative Nonfiction, a portable library full of recommended books culled from excellent book lists going back a century. The books are arranged in Dewey Decimal Classification order and are on every topic. And my second book, Library Lens Biographies, Autobiographies, and Memoirs presents the wonderful books about people that I couldn't find room for in my first book. If you love to read about people, then this book is for you. You can find links to all these books in the description box below. So that's it for this time. Until next time, happy reading.